make sure you got notes. You can follow along, maybe write some things down. We're going to get into part six tonight of the series we're doing on prayer. You know, we've done a lot of interesting series through the years How about the historic revivals from Wesley all the way to present day. We've looked at end time prophecy, spine of prophecy and the, the other series, Revelation and Final Days. And we've looked at the Hebrew roots of the faith. We've done a lot of different subjects, you know. A lot of things that, that were pretty interesting, people really got into. But I believe that this particular series on prayer is probably the most important that I've ever taught. And the reason being, that one on blood covenant and then this one on prayer go together. But I believe it's helping people to really have a personal relationship with the Lord. And how many knows that the Lord's coming for a people that are people of prayer that are spending time with him they've, they've cleansed their lives they're filled with extra oil that's why jesus said watch and pray you do not know the day nor the hour <clears throat> he's coming for those that watch and pray amen all right so lord as we get into this tonight we thank you for your word i thank you for an open heaven your glory in this place i thank you lord for your power present and tonight the holy spirit moving upon every one of us to give you our best ear our full attention our focus that will be locked into what you're saying to us it reminds me of revelation he that has ears to hear let let him hear what the spirit is saying to the churches though we need to have eyes and ears of the spirit help us Lord, that you touch our eyes and our ears that we can see by the holy spirit maybe what we couldn't before we can hear things that maybe we wouldn't have been able to hear before but you give us the grace to be able to hear it help us Lord, to have good soil of hearts and minds and lives that'll be ready and receptive it's not going to be like the stony ground but our we're good soil so the seed of your word can go out and be sown into that good soil as you speak through me everything that needs to be spoken it'll be watered by the holy spirit grow take root grow and produce a hundredfold harvest of eternal fruit that remains till jesus comes and we thank you lord for the winds of your spirit carrying this out among the nations it will get where it's supposed to accomplish what it's supposed to for the word will not return void but go forth and accomplish everything you sent it for to do and we take authority the birds of the air try to steal the seed so we bind anything of the enemy that would try to hinder this word from getting where it's supposed to and accomplish what it's supposed to in jesus name we bind you you will back off right now but lord we thank you for this being a powerful time that everything is going to be said and heard and everything accomplished that you will be done in jesus name we pray amen all right so up until this point this is part six we're going to be dealing with our daily bread but up to this point in your prayer time you're gonna as you come through you say our father and you begin to come through the blood of jesus there's something so powerful in the book of hebrews it talks about you can enter the holy of holies what, what by the blood of the lamb that your hearts are sprinkled by the blood and your bodies washed with pure water so let me just say that water baptism is important and it is powerful and so anyway as we come through the blood that's what our focus is the our father and then we move into hallowed be your name we move into worship worship is what brings you into the presence of the lord it's so important don't neglect the worship part of your prayer life and then you go as you're worshiping him you're coming through the blood you're hallowing the lord's name your mind is being renewed with the word of god your mind is meditating on the scriptures on the god of blood covenant what he paid for you in the covenant to have and as you hallow his name the different names of god the promises and scriptures linked to that how many knows that that is powerful because your mind is being renewed with the word of god and it's also building up your faith and then we move from that time of coming through the blood and worship we move into your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven there's something about using your authority and you're saying into whatever person place or situation father your kingdom come now your will be done on earth as it is in heaven we command it to be so and you're speaking into that situation or into that person's life lord into that individual your kingdom come will of god be done in them and it's like i could just see things lining up with the will of god you see it, it's you using your authority and as you take authority you're keeping in mind that the enemy's trying to hinder the plans of god so you're binding satan you're commanding him to get out of situations 
and you're praying the will of God. And so what's happening is, is that your priorities are now kingdom priorities because you're not overly concerned with your own selfish needs at this point, but rather you're praying that God's kingdom and his will is going to be done in the earth. And so you're putting his priorities as a focus. And also you're praying at this time that the grace of God for us to be faithful in all things. Amen? That we will be faithful. Faithful to God's house. Faithful in our giving. Faithful in doing what God's called us to do. That we'll be in the center of God's will. And it is a direct confrontation with the enemy. And I think about a man, I've shared this many times, but his son is now really being used of the Lord in the ministry. But there was a time when he was in sin. And this man of God would get up every day and he would take authority out loud. He said, Satan, I bind you. You will not have my son. You will release him into the will of God. I command it in Jesus' name. He did that every day. And this went on for a while, I think years. But eventually something snapped and his son uh, not only got saved but went into the ministry. Now he's winning many souls and seeing a lot of things happening. It's really powerful. So you have to use your authority and keep using your authority. How many know some things may change overnight? Other things may take years before it changes. But if you'll be persistent, you will see it happen. And that's what I read out of uh, Larry Lee's book, Could You Not Tarry One Hour? I was reading to you guys. There, there's a, a quote he did of Kenneth Hagin. And Kenneth Hagin said this. He said, many people take what I teach. So they'll just take one thing that I teach and they'll run with it. And that's all they talk about. He said, there is something to praying once and believe you have received it. It's done. You confess it. It's over with. You expect it. There is something to that because the Bible says in Mark 11, pray and believe you have received it. Okay, there is something to that. But Kenneth Hagin said, there are other things that that will not work. He said this. He said, you have to learn to pray it through and the art of intercession will have to be understood as you learn to pray some things through. Now, how many knows that's truth? Amen. That is the truth. Some things you can pray the prayer of faith and you know that it's done. You don't have to keep harping on it. But other things you're going to have to plow. And prayer can be just like uh, setting up a fence. Some of you may have done this. Others have not done this. But when you look, some days you've got to sit there and dig a hole. You've got to set a post. You've got to pour semen in. It's work. It's more work. It's more work, but eventually, whenever the fence is set up and it's done, it's kind of like an electric fence. You finally get it set up. One of these days, you flip the switch and electricity goes through and it's over. It's done. And that, that's how it works. It's like in prayer, sometimes you're plowing and you're plowing. Months go by, years go by, but eventually one day you've plowed it all the way through in intercession, and now it's time for the power of God to search through and what you've been believing for is done, Okay. All right, so as you're praying, we're moving from the blood to worship into using our authority. Your kingdom come will be done. Now we're moving into areas of give us this day our daily bread. So this is where the focus is now shifting from using your authority in a kingdom mindset to personal needs. Isn't it interesting that the Lord put this in the Lord's Prayer because God wants us to know that he does care about our personal needs. And you'll see this tonight as I read some scriptures to you. But we're going to look at God's provision. The God who takes care of us. I'll probably read this scripture. I think it's the one I have in my notes. Yep, there it is. That the birds of the air, Jesus said, if the Lord feeds the birds, how much more is he going to take care of us? Okay, my wife knows about these things because she has these bird feeders up. Okay, we have all these kind of like they're outdoor, but they're kind of like our pet birds. You know, we have these different ones, but the blue jays are big and they're not very friendly. You know, they should be thankful that we feed them, shouldn't they? My wife's back there amening me. But anyway, they're not the nicest birds. I remember one time this mockingbird kept flying up in our face. <laughs> Probably shouldn't tell this. It's funny though. But we're sitting there just minding our own business. Keep in mind that we feed them. They should be thankful. They get food. There's a little fountain there. They've got it made, right? And we're sitting around the porch one time, and this, this bird kept flying in our face and flapping his wings and yelling at us. And, I mean, I don't know if we were too close to his nest or what the problem was, but my wife was out there with a fly swatter because there were some flies. And we're sitting there, and this bird circles around and sits, I mean, right next to her on the balcony and is yelling at her. 
And my wife just had her fly swatter and looked at it, whack, hit him on the head. <laughs> that bird flew up to the neighbor's house, which isn't far at all, and was just looking at her with that one eye, you know, just staring at her. But he didn't do it again. I still laugh about that. All right, so that has nothing to do with my sermon, but that, anyway, let's get back on track. But here's a couple of things. If we're looking at God supplying our needs, number one, make sure that you're in the will of God and that you're seeking first God's kingdom, okay? If we're living outside of the known will of God and we're not seeking first God's kingdom, it can hinder our needs being met. Did everybody hear what I said? If we're living outside of the will of God, I wonder how many times people don't really pray about where they live, where they work, and really pray about where God is putting them in a church. That they really pray about every important thing and make sure that they're in God's will, the center of his will. And make sure that your priorities are in order, that you're seeking first the kingdom of God. Okay, that you're in his will, your priorities are in order. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. And also make sure that you're submitted to a local church and living right. How many knows that matters? I'm surprised how many people nowadays, of course, we're in the, what the Bible calls the last days. There's a lot of rebellion. But I'm shocked to see how many people don't go to church like they should. The Bible says, do not forsake the assemblings of yourselves together as some are in the manner of doing, but all the more as you see the day approaching. And here we are, it is very clear that we're in the last days. We are the people, the writer of Hebrews is saying, all the more as you see Christ coming near. So he was speaking to you and I in these last days that we better make sure we're coming together in a local church setting. Why? Because there's something supernaturally powerful about the authority that God has invested in the local church. I remember reading that, that I really respect Derek Prince. He had a lot of wisdom. And he said that even though he had an itinerant ministry and traveled all those years, he said he always made sure that he was a part of a local church and under the covering of a pastor. He refused to go out somewhere preaching and facing the spiritual darkness in different regions of the earth without being properly covered. He said, if you want to, it, basically he was saying, if I could paraphrase, you open yourself up to spiritual destruction when you're out there by yourself like some rebel that won't come under authority like you should. We've got to be careful that we're under kingdom authority. And I have been shocked at how much authority God invest in the local church. I can feel it. I feel it as a pastor. I feel it as a congregation. As people come into this fellowship, I've seen the level of protection over their lives. I've seen God uh, supply needs and heal people and protect people and deliver people. There's something about the church that's so powerful. Amen? All right. And then also that we're living right. And finally, I would say make sure that you're faithful in your work habits. Because 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says, if you don't work, you don't eat. That's about as clear as Paul could say it, amen? People that refuse to hold down a job, people that refuse to be responsible, the problem was that there were those that were looking for handouts for the, from the church to take care of them. And Paul said, okay, you make sure that you give it to the widows and the orphans and those that are in need, but people that are too lazy to work and get out and do right, he said, don't give them any money. If they don't want to work, then they just don't eat. How many knows when you go hungry for a while, you might change your mind about your work habits? All right, so... Another couple things I want to mention before I really get into where I'm going. When we say, give us this day our daily bread, I would submit to you that, yes, that is talking about actual finances and our needs met. Absolutely. But I would say that also let's consider this. The priest had in the holy place the table of showbread where they had 12 loaves of unleavened bread that they would eat from. And, I, and it speaks of spiritual bread. 
I would submit to you that not only is this talking about your natural needs, but your spiritual needs. That God knows what we need. He knows that we need to learn things from his word. He knows that we need to hear from him sometimes, something specific. You know, as I've learned how to pray effectively, whenever I leave out of my prayer time, I, I feel that I am satisfied like I've eaten a full course meal spiritually speaking and I feel strong and I, and I feel refreshed and we need that and I would warn people do not let church become the only place that you're eating spiritually because you're going to starve you cannot depend on just uh, once a week at church to be enough for you you've got to learn how the Bible says Paul said we've been given the same spirit to drink from. And the word of God is like a food source to us. The Lord is our good shepherd. He leads us beside the, what the still waters. That's the refreshing of the Holy Spirit. And into green pastures, that's the word of God. And as we spend time in God's presence, in the word, we're, being, we're feeding spiritually. We're becoming healthy and strong. Think about it for a moment. If you had sheep and one of them wasn't getting enough to eat and the other one was eating all the time and having plenty of water to drink, you're going to notice that one of them is healthy and the other is not healthy. And I can imagine spiritually speaking that the Lord looks down upon all of us and he can see that we, we've been led to green pastures and still waters, but some people are not taking advantage of that. And so they're weak spiritually and somewhat anemic and vulnerable to spiritual attacks while other people are feeding and they're strong and healthy and ready for the war. And so I would say that the first thing we need to consider is that our spiritual bread, that, that we're eating and feasting from the Lord on our own, okay? The second thing is, let me give you ways. I'm gonna come back to this toward the end once we get past the Lord's Prayer I'm going to talk about a lot of different things I think will help you in connection with prayer. But one of them will be I'll devote an entire sermon on hearing from God. How many want to hear God speak to you? Let me tell you, it's an awesome thing. And God, God wants to speak to all of us, but we've got to learn how to hear from him. And let me tell you, it's important, I think even vital, that we learn how to hear from him because there's been times that we needed to know something because it was very serious. You come to a point in time in life where you got to make one decision or the other. You need to know what God is leading you to do. It can determine whether or not you're going to relocate to another area, you're going to go to a different job, you're, you're, you know, you're taking your kids to a totally different place and their life. You need to make sure you've heard from God about that. And if you're in a crossroads where you have multiple options that you could choose from, you need to hear from God. Amen. And so let me give you a couple ways that God has given us provision to hear from him. And let me say something as well, because this is on my mind right now. I think the Lord would have me say it. The hearing from God also could spare you from something very dangerous. And let me give you just one story because there's a lot that I could think of and share. But this was last year, maybe the beginning of this year, but I think it was the end of last year that my wife was driving to work early in the morning and the Lord spoke to her that she needed to back off in the car. So she let off the gas and backed off. And then what was it that happened? There was a wreck or something. Oh, yeah. All right. So I don't remember all the details. I should have her up here telling it, but there was some kind of a road rage and somebody had swerved over. If she had not pulled back, she probably would have had an accident. And the Lord spoke to her back off from it. And she did right as that happened. I think that one guy pulled a gun and everything. It was crazy. So the Lord wants to guide us away from danger, but we have to learn to hear from him. All right, here's some ways that God speaks revelation and direction to us. Number one, his word. 
And so I'm one that I believe that we still need to have a physical Bible, not just your phone. That's my opinion. We need to have an actual Bible. Don't be surprised one day should the Lord tarry that they don't move to get the Bible off the Internet anyway. Every Bible app will be removed from your phone. The only thing you're going to be able to go back to is a good Bible. So I encourage you to get a physical Bible in hand that you can bring with you to church and also something to journal with, but you need to have a Bible. As we read the Bible, this is the main way that God's always going to speak to us because everything that pertains to life is somewhere in this 66 books that God's given us here. And if we know this and we really understand this book, this will be a source of great wisdom and revelation throughout life. Also, this is what's called logos in the Greek because it's already written and it's something God already spoke in the past. But God can take this, his Logos word, and you can be led to read a story in the Bible. And that word moves from just being something that was written about thousands of years ago to applying to you today. And it's as though God is using a story to speak to you now. And it moves from being a Logos to now a Rhema word for you today in 2024. But many times God has spoken to me through his word. Many times where I'll be needing direction and God will put a specific story in the Bible and I'll go back and read and study that. I've had so many times where people that are prophetic would tell me a story in the Bible and say, this is where you're at. This is what you're dealing with. This story in the Bible is pertaining to your life situation right now. And it was true. So the main way God speaks to us is through his word. Study this word, get it in your spirit. You've got to know it for yourself. The second way God speaks to us is by his Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit may speak directly to you where you actually hear his voice. God speaks to you. I've had that happen to me. But also the Holy Spirit many times will speak to you by an inner witness in your spirit that you kn- somehow you know something in your knower, but you can't really explain why you know it. You just know. That's the Holy Spirit in you. How many have ever experienced that before? You just knew something was not quite right about this. You don't know how you knew it, but you just knew something was not as it seemed. And that's the Holy Spirit in you saying, nope, something's not right there. If you go to have, to make a decision or to enter into a business deal or something, and you have that check in your spirit, something's not quite right. You need to listen to that. That's the Holy Spirit. So we learn to be led by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit in you will give you peace about a situation, or he will give you a check that you know something's not right. The Holy Spirit, we've got to learn. Romans chapter 8, those that are sons of God, and that implies maturity, sonship, no longer a babe, but moving into sonship. He's saying those that are sons of God have learned to be led by the Spirit of God. Okay. Number three, another way God will speak is through trusted people. I think about Brother Holt, for example. Every time I go to see him... He always has some kind of word from the Lord for me. And every time, 100% of the time, over a long, what, decades? How long have I known Brother Holt? For years and years and years and years, he has always been right every time. He's a trusted person in my life. Amen? And God has certain people that you know that they're men or women of God. And when they feel something for you, you need to take it serious and pray about it. Because there's even times that Brother Holt told me something years ago. I've learned now just to listen. But years and years ago, I thought to myself, man, that guy's crazy. You know what he's talking about. And then it was right. So you learn to humble yourself and listen to men and women of God. Amen. That's important. Another way God will speak to you, but you've kind of got to get some discernment about this, is through dreams and visions. How many have ever had a dream that you knew was from God and it was, and then it ended up coming to pass? I have. My wife has definitely had some of those. 
or a vision where you see something in prayer. I've had very, sometimes very clear visions. But God speaks through dreams and visions. You can read that all through the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Think about in the Old Testament, like for example, when Nebuchadnezzar had that dream or Pharaoh did about the famine that was coming. Look into the New Testament when Jesus was born and an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, you better get out of here and go to Egypt. And he did. And then all those, uh, Herod sent those military men in there and they killed all the babes. Remember that? So God speaks through dreams and visions. And those of us, this is not in my notes. I should have put it in there. But those of us that have been baptized in the Holy Spirit and, and you're operating in the gifts, God also speaks through the gifts of the Spirit. There's been times that my wife and I, we pray together at night before we go to bed or whatnot. And so I remember there's times periodically we'll be praying together and she'll, she knows this. All of a sudden, there'll be a message in tongues. And then will come the interpretation. And it really helped us because that's something we really needed to hear. So God will speak through prophecy. In fact, a few, maybe about a week ago, we were praying together and the Holy Spirit just kind of came on me in the way of prophecy and was giving me revelation. And we were talking, it was just like the Lord was just talking straight to us. And it was really important information that we needed to know. So God will operate through the gifts. And then finally, let me say this. When God speaks to you through his word or by his spirit, through a dream or whatever, you need to journal it. It's important that you write things down and you journal it. Did y'all hear what I said? Because... How many knows when God gives you something, he expects us to take it seriously and really pray into it and use that information. If God speaks to you, think about this, the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God that's got, what, seven and a half billion people on the planet, and he's up there and he's gracious enough to speak to me something, and I don't even take the time to write it down and pray into it or take, and it's like I forget about it after two or three days. Do you really think he's going to go to great lengths to keep speaking to somebody like that that doesn't seem to care about that information? He wants us to take what he's saying seriously. Lord, thank you for speaking to me and write it down and document that and really pray into it and get everything out of that. And he'll look down and go, man, that individual takes what I say so seriously to him who's given will be given more. So God will speak to you more if he knows that you're somebody that will really listen. And another thing I would say is whenever God does speak to you something, do not be too quick to share that information with people. God wants to know that he can trust us with information. Because sometimes God will give you something and it's not intended to be shared with people. Did y'all hear what I said? I think about... Do you remember this, the life and story of Joseph? God showed Joseph wonderful revelation. It was truly from him. But how many knows when he shared that with his brothers, it did not lead to a good thing for him. It would have been much better off if maybe he just committed that to prayer and never said anything to anybody about it. So let's use wisdom about what we hear from the Lord. And sometimes I believe God shows you something just to pray about it. All right. Now, let's move on. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak now as we kind of start moving toward closing this out about finances. Now, Jesus talked about money in multiple places. He said in one place, give and it will be given back to you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. Men will pour into your bosom. So Jesus talked about finances. He talked about giving and it will be given back to you. So you see the law of sowing and reaping there. Did everybody catch that? I'm trying to make a point here that Jesus Christ taught this. All right. Now look at another place in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore I say to you, take no thought about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. 
Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, nor do they reap, nor do they gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And he uses my wife to do it. <laughs> all are not all, are they not much better? I'm sorry. Are you not much more better than they who among you can, by taking thought, add a cubit to, its, to your stature? But Jesus says, why take thought about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither work nor they spin. Yet I say that to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed like one of these. Therefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. Notice that he's saying there that the heathen are chasing after material things too much. Everybody catch that? For your heavenly father knows that you need these things. How many knows you need food? You need clothes to wear, amen? And your heavenly father knows that. Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be given to you. Therefore, take no thought about tomorrow. For tomorrow will take thought about itself. Sufficient to the day or uh, sufficient to the day is the trouble thereof. So in other words, don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough issues to be concerned about right now. Now, here's the situation. My wife and I have actually had to talk about this at times. Because, you know, the, the sources of in income for both of us require faith. Is there's times that we haven't necessarily known what tomorrow shall hold. Am I not telling the truth? <laughs> She's a big amen. There's times that we don't know for sure what tomorrow holds, but we've made up our mind that we're not going to worry about that. We're just going to be thankful. And every day when I go to bed at night, I thank you, Lord. We have a roof over our head. I thank you that today our bills are paid. We've had food to eat. Our needs are met. And I thank you, Lord, that you'll take care of tomorrow. And he does. You know, we don't go chasing after all these things, but if you'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and you'll truly be a giver, he said this in the word, if you'll seek first the kingdom, all these other things shall be added to you. And so all of a sudden, as we've really sought first the kingdom of God, all these other things have been added to us through the years without a lot of effort. God just takes care of things, doesn't he? You always dread now trying to, you know, my parents have always lived a good life and been wise with money, but they're, they've always been givers, tithers, big givers in the church my whole life, you know. And so as they've been faithful to live right and be givers, God's blessed them. Well, that's wonderful, and I'm so thankful for that, but it doesn't make it easy on me as a son when it comes time for Father's Day. Or for his birthday or my mom's Christmas present because I have no idea what to buy them. They need nothing, which is wonderful and I'm thankful for. But at the same time, they're not easy to buy for. But I have found the same thing is beginning to be true about my wife and I because if you'll, if you'll really live a Christian life and seek first the kingdom and you'll be faithful in your tithes and offerings, over the years, God just keeps adding what, whatever it is you need He'll just give that to you. And then eventually, one day, your daughter's like, I have no idea what to buy dad for Father's Day, you know, because you don't really need anything. But if you'll seek first the kingdom. All right, so let me move on. As we're praying, we move now from our Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread. Let me give you a few more scriptures and then I'm going to give you some advice about believing God for finances. Scriptural views of prosperity. All right. Just look this way. I'm trying to say this the right way and use wisdom. But we're living in strange times. Now, because of the internet and things like YouTube or whatever, 
somebody gets an iPad for Christmas and all of a sudden they think that they're a theologian and all of us need to listen to them. They all are smarter than us and they all know. And so you've got a lot of voices, some of them good and a lot of them not good. That's all over the internet. You know what I'm talking about? All right. And so God has invested his authority in the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the evangelist, the teacher, not the YouTuber. Or the little guy or little girl with their little iPad and their little mic, okay? So just use wisdom with who you're listening to because not everybody knows what they're talking about. Now I say that because I'm going to give you some scripture here, but there's been a movement now, I want you to think about this for a moment. If you were the devil, what would you do to hinder God's purposes in the earth? Think about it for a minute. Would not some of the most effective ways to attack people would be attack their health so physically they can't do things for God? Okay, that's... Another thing would be attack where they're fighting all the time and in strife so that they can't get together and unify to do anything for God. But what's another big attack the devil would do? dry up their finances so they can't afford to do anything for God. Even here tonight, for us to be here, we have to pay for this place. It wouldn't be too long that I did not pay for this place that they'd be ask, evicting, kicking, you know, kicking us out. You have to pay for the place. You have to pay for the electricity. You have to pay for the water. You know what I'm talking about. It takes, it takes finances to do anything. God knows that and Satan knows that. So you get these goofy people that create phrases that are not anywhere in the Bible. It's just their criticisms about things like they call it the prosperity gospel. They've made up this little phrase that they coin. And what that is now is an attack against any teaching scripturally about finances. Even though Jesus Christ himself taught us, give, be a giver, it will be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together. So he's taught, Jesus taught us the law of sowing and reaping. And it's about finances. Let me give you a few others. In 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, this is the apostle Paul talking here and he's trying to teach us a principle. He said, listen to this scripture. It says, for you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might be rich. Isn't that interesting? Now, people's definition of rich probably needs to be changed to more of a scriptural understanding of what that means. But nonetheless, Christ became poor so that we can live in an abundant life. I think about the, what is the thief, John 10, what does the thief come to do? To steal. But Jesus said, I've come to give abundant life. So Satan is the one that is trying to create poverty, lack, insufficiency. God is the one that wants to make sure your needs are met in abundance so that what you can be a blessing to the kingdom of God. That's why. Now, he's not doing it so you can go out and buy a big, necessarily a big yacht and a giant this, that, and the other and, and all these ex European vacations. Listen, God, I'm not saying there's something wrong with people that maybe have the money to do that. I'm just saying God wants you to have abundance so that you can be taken care of and you can be a blessing to other people. Okay? That's a kingdom mentality. And then I think about 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6, and this is talking about finances. He said, but I say this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Let every man give according to the purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And think about the way God views cheerful giving. I think about the, the widow's might. Remember that parable? That people that had wealth came in and they dropped a big chunk of money in there. And this widow comes up and she sacrificially gave a mite, which it wasn't much, but it was a lot for her. And Jesus said, from God's perspective, she gave more than the people that gave out of their abundance. Think about that. 
So God sees the sacrificial giving that people make. It matters to him. I want you to think about it. Jesus is God in the flesh, right? Jesus Christ was paying attention to who was giving, and he's the one that brought up the widow with the might. He noticed her giving, and he brought it up to the disciples. So it's important to God that we're givers. I think about Cornelius. When it was time now for the gospel and Pentecost and what Christ had invested in the early church to spread outside of Jerusalem and go to the Gentiles, God looked down and found a man by the name of Cornelius who is an Italian guy. He was a Gentile. And listen to what it said about Cornelius. You go read this in the book of Acts. The angel of the Lord was sent to this man. How many have had an angel sent to you to give you a message? I haven't had that. This guy was so important to God. God had, he had caught God's attention that God sent him an angel that spoke to him. And this angel said to Cornelius, listen to what he said. He said, Cornelius, your prayers, your prayer life, and your giving has gone up to God as a memorial offering. Now send for Peter, who's in Joppa, to come to you. Wow. God took notice of Cornelius' prayer life and his financial giving, and it went up to God as a memorial offering. And when it was time for the gospel to go from just being Jewish now to the Gentiles, he was the one that it began with. And Peter had a vision where God spoke to Peter and said, go with the people I'm sending to you. And he dropped down the net and showed him the unclean animals. And basically through the vision, God told Peter, I'm taking the gospel to the Gentiles. Peter goes to Cornelius' house. Cornelius knew Peter was coming. I mean, the guy saw an angel. So I imagine he told all of his family and friends, how many of you would take notice if one of your relatives came to you and said, God sent an angel to me. I saw the angel and the angel told me to send for this preacher who's coming to my house. How many would think that your relatives and friends would take notice and might show up that day? So Cornelius had a big gathering there of family and friends. And Peter comes, and while Peter is speaking to the Gentiles, the Bible says the Holy Spirit fell on them the same way that he fell on the day of Pentecost. Those people were baptized in the Holy Ghost and with fire and started speaking in tongues. And Peter's companions were shocked to see that happening to the Gentiles. How did it come about? God, a man by the name of Cornelius, had a prayer life and he was a cheerful, generous giver. And that went up into God. It got God's attention and God sent revival to his family. And listen. I think about the scripture where it says, if you're a tither, God said, I will open the heavens and pour out more of a blessing than there's room enough to contain. It also says, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. But I want you to think about an open heaven. An open heaven is not just financial blessings, is it? An open heaven is revival. That's what Cornelius experienced. He experienced a spiritual outpouring. And I remember, for example, I'm bringing up Derek Prince again tonight, but he was talking about when he went to the Pensacola Revival back in the 90s, and he was there. And I remember him talking about it or writing about it, but I remember this. He said that he found out from the pastor at that great revival that even before revival broke out, that the overwhelming majority of the congregation, almost everybody was tithers and givers. And Derek Prince said this, he said, that is one of the reasons God's poured out his spirit here is because there's an open heaven because they're givers. Did y'all hear that? So it means something to God. So scriptural views of prosperity, God is the one who's come to give us an abundant life. Now the apostle Paul who wrote this also said, I know what it is to be abounding, and I know what it is to be abased. You know what that means? I, just like you, have had times where financially I was doing really good and other times where I was struggling. Look, we're all going to go through things. 
And that's why God gives us testimonies, amen? There's been multiple times where my wife and I felt like we were hitting a brick wall financially. We had to pray, but we knew that we could stand on the promises that we are faithful in our tithes and offerings and that God said he would rebuke the devourer and he would open the heavens and he would pour out a blessing. And the scripture's about he'll supply our needs. And you know what? As we stood in faith, God did it. So let me give you some specifics tonight. When you pray about your financial needs, whatever it is, remember this. It's very important. Be specific. If you need $100, pray specifically for $100. You need to learn to pray very specific, as specific as you can. And learn to get maybe wisdom from the Lord on how to pray about situations. Because God will give you very specific, strategic ways of praying if you ask him that that will open something up for you. And I tell this story a lot, but in case I haven't got it in this series, I need to share it. Dr. Cho's famous story about his bicycle. Probably you know this story, but just in case people haven't heard it. He was, I believe he was in college. Nonetheless, he needed a bicycle to get around. And so he was asking the Lord for a bike. Time rolls on. He's frustrated. Lord, you said you would supply my needs. I need this bike. Why haven't you supplied this? And the Lord spoke to him and said, which bike? And he realized, I've been praying way too general. And he said, okay. He said, I need this specific bike here, this name brand. He said, and I want this specific color if it's okay. I want this bike. And you know what? Within a short amount of time, he had that bike. And Dr. Cho said, I learned a valuable lesson that day. How many things have we prayed way too general and we didn't get an answer? He said, be as specific as you possibly can because God answers specific prayers. All right, secondly, pray with faith, believing. It is God's will that we're able to pay our bills. It's important that some people hear this because I feel like not necessarily with River of Life, but I feel like there's some people out there that somehow somebody confused you into thinking that poor is spiritual. You were lied to. And I feel bad for you because you probably have struggled unnecessarily. The Bible talks about renewing our minds with what? The Word of God. And pulling down every stronghold. Listen, we need to get out of any poverty mentality and into a prosperity mentality. It is God's will that we can pay our bills. It is God's will that you have food to eat, that your needs are met, and that your kids and grandkids are taken care of. That's just the way it is. God is interested in that. And there's scriptures in the Bible like David said, I've never seen God's seed begging for bread. Amen? It's not God's will that his people are living in poverty and struggling. But yet, decisions sometimes are made that, get, that we get ourselves in trouble. I remember one time, we, we have a homeless ministry, and so... I'll never forget this because, you know, we raised our daughter to understand that these things. But we, she, they were out there ministering to the homeless and somebody, which, by the way, I know that there's always exceptions to the rules, but a lot of times people have made decisions and then more bad decisions upon more bad decisions that got them in that situation. But yet a lot of times they'll turn around and blame God for their situation. How many have seen that before? Well, somebody was out there and they were, they were frustrated about their situation. They said, I've given my life to Christ and I don't understand this. I don't understand why I'm going through this and what's going on. And, and Brianna said, well, listen, if you've really given your life to the Lord, why don't you start praying and believing God to help you get out of the situation you're in? And the person just sat there and said, you know, I never thought of that. What does the Bible say? My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. Amen. God wants our needs met. 
I believe that when people look at Christians and they see that we're doing well, that God is taking good care of us, I believe that it helps people be drawn toward a good God that takes care of his people. That's just my opinion. But pray with faith and also speak faith confessions. It's important that your mouth is speaking faith. Did you know that you can pray about something and then end up talking yourself right out of it? You can pray about something God heard you and he started to do it and then your own mouth can speak negative death curses and can abort the very prayer you just prayed. When you pray about something, your mouth needs to be saying, Lord, I thank you that you've heard me and this is happening. I may not see it right now, but I will see it. It's coming to pass in Jesus' name. Quote scriptures. Also, you need to take authority over the enemy. There's times that since my wife and I have been married, there's been a few times that I distinctly remember that we felt that there was like a spirit that was trying to block finances and i'm not saying it's every time that you go through something difficult it's it's the enemy i'm not saying that even though jesus did say though remember satan has come what to steal kill and destroy he's come to steal but there has been a few times that we discerned it was a spirit and when we did we took authority over that thing in jesus name we bind that foul spirit of lack and poverty it's trying to block what god has for us you will give up our finances get out of the way Give it up. We bind you. And we took authority. And after that, you know what? Finances came in. Sometimes the enemy will try to block it. The next one I would say is pray for the Holy Spirit to move. There's a scripture. You may, if you're taking notes, you might want to write this down. It's in Proverbs. It says, Lord, remove the wicked out of the presence of the king so that his righteous throne can be established. Remove the wicked. I want you to remember that scripture. Look it up because that's a powerful scripture. There are times, if y'all can look this way and hear me, there are times that Satan wants to have wicked people that he can use that will try to get in the way to where Satan can use them to try to hurt you financially or hurt your business. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Has anybody ever had dealings with somebody that it's like, Lord, this person and they were being used of the devil to try to hinder something for you get you fired trying to mess up your business dealings they're trying to do something to hinder you financially that's a scripture that god will honor and he will use that lord i thank you for removing the wicked out of the presence of the king so that your righteous throne can be established in my life look god will remove the hindrances out of the way but pray that the Holy Spirit will move. The Holy Spirit is the one that will give you favor with people. The Holy Spirit is the one that moves upon people's hearts. Jesus said, pressed down, shaken together, will men give unto you. The Holy Spirit is the one. Think about when Israel left Egypt. Egypt was glad to see him go. But God moved on the hearts of the Egyptians that whenever Israel said, can you give us some of your silver and gold? The Bible says that God moved on the hearts of the Egyptians, the wicked, and they gave Israel their silver and gold and their clothing and everything else and said, just get out of here. God moved on the hearts of wicked people to bless God's people. Did you know that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous and that God could move on the heart of somebody? You may think to yourself, well, God, how in the world would this ever happen? God could move on the heart of somebody that's actually a wicked person, but he could put it on their heart to do something that will cause great financial increase to come to you. How many knows God is, can do that? Amen. So pray that the holy spirit will move in your financial situation and finally that angels are sent how many knows that the angels of the lord can go places you can't go can do things you can't do and those angels can remove the wrong people out of the way and they can cause finances to come your direction so let's go through it be specific pray with faith take authority over the enemy 
Ask God's Holy Spirit to move. It's like blowing in the provision, moving on the hearts of people, and that angels are sent to go gather it in. And let me close with this. Pray with right motives. Let me give some warning here. I believe personally my view after reading the Bible and reading about Abraham, reading about Moses, reading about all these different people through the scriptures, I believe it's God's will that we prosper and be taken care of. I just do. But there's a warning about finances though. 1 Timothy 6.10 says this, that the love of money is the root of all evil. Everybody say the love of money. Does that mean that money is the root of all evil? No. Because the same $100 bill that could pay a bill or, or feed people that are hungry is the same $100 bill that could be used to buy drugs or ruin somebody's life. I mean, money is just money. But the love of money is the root of all evil. How many people have been murdered down through the years because of the love of money? How many people have been betrayed? How many horrendous things have happened because of the love of money? But he says here, Paul said, the love of money is the root of all evil. While coveting after money, some have strayed away from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But did you know another scripture says this? It's the blessing of the Lord that makes rich and adds no sorrow to it. But see, the love of money will cause people to do foolish things and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. But if you'll seek first the kingdom, God's blessing can make rich and add no sorrow. And then also asking with right motives. James 4 verse 3, he said, You ask, but you do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your own passions or your own lusts. You adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And whoever, therefore, is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So he's saying that some people ask and they don't receive financially because their desire is only to spend it on their own lusts. And God knows when they're asking him that their heart is just for their own lusts. But if God looks down and he sees somebody that is faithful like Cornelius to have a prayer life. They love God. They seek first the kingdom of God. When God blesses them financially, they give God's due to the church and they're to people around them. They make sure that if somebody's in need, they help them. He looks down and sees that. To whom much is given, God will give more. He says, I can trust this person. And they ask him, say, Lord, I need finances. And the Lord says, sure. And, you know, he knows that he can trust those type of people. But some people don't receive because he knows that they're just covetous with it. And I believe that River of Life, I felt this for some time, that God has got some things in store for River of Life financially that he's always blessed and taking care of us. I mean, we have everything that we need in the church, but I believe that there's, there's some things that need to happen in the future that's going to take finances. But I believe God's going to supply it with abundance. I really do. But he may come through some of you, and it may be because he can trust you. But he also, how many knows he can move upon anybody to give into the ministry? And so let's just believe God with our finances. And I just want to share some of those scriptures because I want you to have faith. The Bible says God delights in the prosperity of his servant. God wants you blessed. Did you know the blessings of Abraham? It, Derek Prince broke them down. He said there's blessings and curses. There was nine categories of curses under the law, which Galatians 13 we've been redeemed from, but there were seven categories of blessings. You know what they were? The first category is to be the head, not the tail, that God will promote you. The second was healing and health. The third was long life on the earth. But you know what the fourth was? Prosperity. The blessings of Abraham include prosperity. Look at Abraham's life. Abraham was blessed. And then another blessing was abundance, that he had more than enough. 
And then another category was favor, that God will give you favor with people. And then the seventh is victory over your enemies. But I think about Abraham, and I've seen this in my own life. Don't get too upset whenever things seem to not be going your way. Let me tell you something I've learned. There has been enough times in my life now where I've gone to do something financially and somebody messed it up. And I'm over here going, guys, you just messed. And then here's what happens. Sir, I'm so sorry. Here's a bunch of free stuff. We'll, we're going to do it now at a discount. Come back another time and here's a coupon for 50%. Off. You see what I'm saying? And I've learned now that whenever things go sideways, I'm just thinking, I wonder what's going to come out of this. Now, wait a second. Is that scriptural? Let me tell you just one story. Abraham goes into Egypt because of a famine. Pharaoh takes his wife. Abraham is angry, he's upset, he's frustrated, he's praying to God, why did this bad thing happen to me? You know what happens? God struck Pharaoh and them with a plague, but listen, Abraham got his wife back, and Pharaoh, the most wealthy, powerful man of that time, gave Abraham a ton of wealth. Here's all these sheep and oxen and, and all this gold and silver, whatever he gave him, I don't remember. Here's all this exorbitant wealth, now take your wife and get out of Egypt. And so Abraham came in and had a huge problem. But God turned the problem around and Abraham came out wealthier than he could have ever imagined. So it is scriptural. Don't get frustrated sometimes when things seem to go sideways because it might be God is setting you up for a blessing. I've had that happen a number of times in my own life. My Lord, we thank you that you supply our needs according to your riches and glory. Lord, we thank you that you are faithful. If we will be faithful in our tithes and offerings, it will be faithful to be givers, cheerful givers, generous givers. We sow, we don't sow sparingly, but we sow in abundance. We will reap in abundance. And Lord, I thank you that I know I'm, I'm speaking here to River of Life. I'm speaking to people that are generous givers, and I know that. So this should just encourage you. But to those out that are hearing this outside of River of Life, if you're not a giver, I encourage you to start being a giver. But Lord, I thank you as we've been faithful in our giving, Lord, that you're going to take care of us. And when we have needs, we can present our needs to you. And the Bible says you will supply all of our needs. Lord, you are faithful to watch over your word, to perform it in our lives. And we will have testimonies of how you miraculously met, met, met needs that came up in life. We thank you for it and we bless you. And Lord, let this be sealed in us tonight in our hearts that we'll have faith to believe you, Lord, for the miraculous in the days to come when we need to believe for finances. We're in the last days and this, this ministry may have to believe for miracle finances. You're the one, Lord, that brings wealth. You're the one that moves things around that we have the finances to do what we need to do. There's millions of people out there that need to be saved. And Lord, I thank you for the wealth that's going to come into ministries, not just here, but other ministries, that we're going to be able to do things that we need to do to reach the lost and be able to have discipleship materials to be able to give those people and be able to do what we need to do for the kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for it. We're seeking first the kingdom and your righteousness and all these other things will be added. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.